Welcome to Get Up in the Yule, Old Time Music with Cameron DeWitt and Friends. This week's friends are Rob McMakin and Jason Cade of Hog Eyed Man. We recorded this a couple weeks ago over Zoom because they live in Georgia and I don't. We tried to make this happen last year, so I decided to do just one more remotely recorded episode, which turns out is pretty fun when I don't have to do it every week. Thank you, vaccines. If you're not already watching this, I made a full video version of this episode. It's up on Get Up in the Pool's Facebook page and my personal YouTube and Instagram accounts. And if you're watching this and you're not subscribed to the Get Up in the Pool podcast, just get on your favorite podcast app and subscribe there. Stick around afterwards and I'll tell you how to keep up with Hog-Eyed Man. Also, I put this week's Patreon bonus track at the very end after the outro as a Christmas gift. Merry Christmas. But first, here's our little holiday party and jam. And because it's a remotely recorded episode, it is filled with the screams of my children. Enjoy. Rob McMakin and Jason Cade, aka Hog Eyed Man, welcome to Get Up in the Cool. Hey, Cameron. Thanks for having us. Good to see yeah. you again, Cameron. Uh, you posted a video of, I believe it was these two tunes, like a couple years ago in 2019, maybe. And maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe it was then or the year before. I think I think that's right. I think it was 2019. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and. Uh, I immediately like went to my banjo and tried to figure out what other carols could be translated to fiddle tunes. And yeah, it's a lot of them kind of, they, they make sense, but you had some extra little things that you added to it to make it feel more old time, which I really appreciated, like taking a beat out, adding a beat in. I think you take a beat out of joy to the world. I think so. One of the repeats. Yeah, that's that. We 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 now because we've we've done it for a couple of years. I, yeah, I yeah. kind of don't remember what we did with it exactly. Yeah, we but, took a beat out. Yeah, in between the yeah. Mm-hmm. It's become the new sort of main version for you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's a another point. Like, I don't, I don't know you two very well, Rob. I've never met you before. Uh, so, Jason, welcome back to the show, Rob. <laughs> Thanks for being on. Uh, I'm not familiar with either of your relationships to Christmas. I don't know if you're Christmas celebrators. If, yeah. 
if that if that video was just like a kind of like a cynical cash in <laughs> or if it, if it meant something to you or somewhere in between it was like, a real tree behind us if you look carefully that's a, a yeah, real that was in Rob's house, tree that video. Yeah, yeah very good yeah um yeah well and i'll start uh, so uh, well one thing i just i really love carols like you know i, I love singing them I like hearing them um and i especially like the super old ones um and and a really amazing thing about that the the first one we did in that melody the um the holly and the ivy is that cecil sharp collected that like the the great collector who also came through appalachia huh um and he collected it like just a few years before he came through madison county um which is the neighboring county from where i grew up and he recorded like mitch wallen who's who's um bard ray's great uncle he recorded the wallens he recorded the rays he recorded like um you know, the Ramses, like a bunch of these families that are just like known as the traditional ballad singers and, and fiddle players and, and banjo players from Madison County. Yeah. Um, and I just think it's amazing that he, he was like, you know, found the Holly and the Ivy tune. Um, that the, 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 I should, I should, I should be clear. Like the tune is older than that, but the melody that everybody plays now and associates with the Holly and the Ivy, he got in 1909 or something like that. Um, cool. In, in I had no idea. Yeah. Um, so it, and you know I think we'll probably play some of some music from that county a little bit later in the in the podcast. But um, so it's for to me they're 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 kind of like fiddle tunes. They work they they work really well as fiddle tunes, and they you know they're they're from back in time, but they're kind of still relevant. You can still make them fun, um, and and that's I, I think that's the the biggest draw for me. It's not so much that they're attached to Christmas, but yeah. um, you know I'm not I'm not a Grinch. I'm not anti Grinch Christmas necessarily. <laughs> how many sizes uh, what size is your heart each of you <laughs> uh yeah i w- when cecil sharp collected holly and the ivy uh was it as i haven't heard it that much it hasn't made its way to like the shopping malls mm. necessarily it's not yeah, like we lives did not cover it Burl right lives yeah yeah, was it? Is it like a multiple verse uh, Christmas carol? Is it a sung carol or is it? An it's a sung carol. Melody? Yeah, okay. it's a sung carol. And and I guess the words I think are um, the words and the concept of the holly and the ivy are are like really old. You know, they're it, I think it's Welsh. Maybe um, actually, maybe that's where he collected. It. He might have collected it in Wales. I'm sorry, I can't remember if it's Wales or England. It doesn't matter. Um, but, but yeah, I think, uh, it definitely has words. Um, but you're right. It's kind of like, it's, it's one of the lesser known, like B side yeah. rarities. It's like, if you're into, you know, deep, deep cut, deep cut carols, <laughs> it's one of the best ones. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the parenthetical like title for this episode. Yeah. Deep cut carols. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess I always kind of forget that this is a lot of this stuff is trad music. Um, I don't necessarily hear a lot of it, uh, in the wild during this time of year, like the, the cooler stuff. Um, right. Yeah. But joy to the world is old too. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just as older, older, you know, it's, th- these are really old melodies. Yeah. I guess that one's been a little bit more appropriated than Holly and the <laughs> Ivy, but yeah. Yeah. Let's play another tune <laughs> that I've total that I've totally already um, uh, overdubbed <laughs> onto your version. <laughs> um, oh, nice! Yeah, no, I haven't. Oh, <laughs> no, you will. This is next week. Yeah, okay. <laughs> peek behind the curtain. We're doing this all out of order. Uh, let's play another tune. What do you want to play next? Were we going to do the Marcus Martin set? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but right. I do think you, you know this one, right? Like you, you. Uh, um, I know you played the jig already. Yeah, right? I did. Yeah. I when you posted the Marcus Martin jig, I was immediately obsessed uh, because not exposed to that much old time canon jiggery. <laughs> uh, I, I was yeah. just about to say jiggery, baby. Yeah, it. <laughs> it seemed like the right thing to say. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. I haven't heard much. Most of the jigs that I'm. I mean, I'm not even that familiar with them, but are like northern tunes uh yeah it, it was really exciting to hear and it's a weird jig yeah mm-hmm. and it's only one I think part it, i think it probably was a song okay 
Yeah, I think it. I think it's his instrumental version of a song. Um, on the recording that we learned it from from him, you, we just you can't make out what he says. The name is he says something, I think, um, but it's impossible to make out what he said. Yeah, isn't it listed as like untitled jig number one or something like something that? something like that? Yeah, I don't yeah. think that's what he said though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. I think. I mean. I think, you know, I don't know why jigs kind of like went extinct in old time music, um, just as, as, you know, it's just the, the four, four festival jams took over. But, um, if you go to any, like any source fiddler, they've mm-hmm. got lots of jigs in their repertoire. I mean, it's, somebody's got a version of the Irish washwoman almost always. Yeah. And, you know, a, a handful of others that were also, you know, recorded by whoever they're. A lot more waltzes too. Yeah. Than you hear. That's true. Yeah. yeah. But waltzes are, I would feel like, I would say are like, are not extinct. Yeah, they're not. You know, they're like, every, at a dance, right. like, you're going to mm-hmm. play a waltz or something. But, yeah. um, the jigs, you know, I guess it's in a part because you can't, you just, there's, there's no backbeat in them. Mm-hmm. There's like, maybe, maybe it's also has to do with the dancing too. Like, mm-hmm. people don't dance jigs, mm-hmm. in, you know, in terms of like, right. Old Appalachian flat footing. Yeah. It'd be cool to see some, if there's any footage of old, buck dancing jigs yeah you know, that'd be cool yeah. it's so funny because like the idea of dancing a jig is a commonly understood idea i don't think anyone yeah or i don't think right. a typical a, the lay the lay person would know what that means to dance a jig but they just mm-hmm. sort of like imagine an old man kind of like wiggling around right um but uh but yeah like the jigs i i wonder if it's just because of the the amount of the dominance of claw hammer banjo players. Yeah. And if that has something to do with it, it's just like not as viable in festival or jam settings, the jig, because they're so goddamn difficult to claw hammer. Yeah. They don't work that well on, on a claw hammer, you know, I yeah. mean, for, for an am, for, I mean, someone like you can figure it out, but like for the, the average player like me, it's just like, it's not worth the effort to figure out the patterns that, that can kind of make it work in a claw hammer style, which is why, (laughs) which is why the next tune is going to open with a two minute claw hammer jig solo (laughs) and then segue into our slower jig. (laughs) Yeah. I was, I was going to say, I'm not sure if what I, what I'm about to do is necessarily worth the effort, um, objectively, but it is fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we do that, um, which we're, we got, you know, we've talked about, we got that from Marcus Martin and then, um, another it's untitled. We got so we'll assume that it's a Christmas. We'll assume that you say you something go. Yuletide. Uh, it would have when. been played at Christmas. Let's say. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then we picked Snowbird, you know, cause it's got the word snow in it. I, that's perfect. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that's of course like a, uh, a Cherokee community in North Carolina, which is Snowbird. Is mm-hmm. a Cherokee? I I didn't know that that was a community. yeah. It goes all the way. It was a, a community that if you just look on you know websites made by Cherokee from that area, they go all the way over to northern South Carolina, but yeah. all the way up to Robbinsville, North Carolina, and it's a. But now there's a cluster of uh, people that are in what's called Snowbird Community up near um, Fontana, um, Robbinsville. I, I've never been there. And, yeah, I've been right. there a few times. Yeah. And there's a cultural arts center, and, and um, you know that the, the alphabets uh, is is used on a lot of the signage around there, um, and you know there's like uh, a lot of people that still up there call themselves Snowbird and Cherokee, huh? Um, and there's like you know as as an ethnic identity. Oh yeah, Snowbird. Well, no, I think I, I think it's Cherokee, but Snowbird is the like he said the community. Right. It, it used to be larger. It used to go as far as the last time I looked. It was North Carolina down to across northeastern Georgia into South Carolina, and and people that were from that area eventually uh, settled up in Snowbird community, and that was quite a while. That was in the early eighteen hundreds. Um, yeah, it's reported. Chief Jim Liska, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's the um, the Cherokee who basically hid out and avoided being driven west on the Trail of Tears, and the Interesting. the community was. Be- either was called or became called Snowbird, mm-hmm. you know, that they were able to basically hide out in and, and, huh. and stay in the mountains there. This tune just gained so much weight. I thought it was literally <laughs> just about a bird. Is it also <laughs> about a bird? 
Um, or is, well, there's is something there weird about that too, right? Like the 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 duty is that the word? D U D I. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's their word for eagle. Right? Oh, is it eagle? I think it's actually their word for eagle, but it uh -huh. they called it the snowbird. I, I'm probably we're probably butchering this history. Yeah. We're not. We're not. You know. But yeah, do D was. I remember because we were researching it for the album and yeah. trying to figure out some. Anyway, uh, but but yeah, yeah, do D was a word for some kind of bird, and and that was the word for eagle when we looked it up. Right? Yeah. But the tune is the tune's an awesome Asheville tune. I mean, it you know bes besides this history and like being associated with that community and and the the Cherokee fiddler Gene Alesco, like it was played by Marcus Martin. It was played by um you know Mango Sneed. yeah um it was played in north georgia um by other people and and i guess maybe it was all traced to jd harris from from tennessee but it's just a funky tune you know it's yeah. a, it's it's just fun to kind of imagine that like it's a it was just a popular tune like way back in time just like it is now i don't know i, I think it's a it's a great tune yeah well thanks for breaking that down and I totally accept the, the, the stretch, the surface level stretch to include it in the Christmas episode. And I think it should be canonized <laughs> and breaking up Christmas jams. Uh, all right, let's, yeah, let's play it. Okay. All right. That was fun playing that tune, Cameron. <laughs> it, it, sh it sure was in the past. <laughs> fun playing that tune together. In the future. <laughs> in the future. Uh, Four-dimensional fun. Um, uh, yeah, what a cool tune. I, I love G-modal tunes uh, because they won't commit to mm -hmm. playing F-sharps or F-naturals. Uh, I think snow, the one you mm -hmm. just played 
if we I remember played. right. Yes. Yeah, the one we just played. Yes. <laughs> um, if I remember right from a couple seconds ago, it's the one that has... Uh, doesn't it have, like, mm -hmm. high F sharps and low F yeah. naturals? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and Rob, you're playing a, a combination of F or gesturing mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. F... Uh, flat seven chords and sure. or or playing d chords i don't know what that uh, is but yes really? sure yeah just kidding. <laughs> yeah uh that seems to be pr pretty common i don't know why that is or if that lays on the fiddle right in a particularly nice way but i think that sound is so ex exciting mm -hmm. yeah um good question i i don't know um there so it's it's really common to hear, like, in modal tunes, to hear that F sharp that's played on the E string. I'm sorry, the F when it's played on the E string as more like an F sharp or something in between. Sure. Um, and when it's on the D string, it could be like a completely just an F natural. Um, I think it, it in part it's just because it's a challenging finger reach to get your first finger back on the E string. Um, so so it could be that's one of the reasons that aesthetic developed. You know, uh, mm. but but there's a lot of I mean you you know you know this already but like there's a lot of sort of microtone approaches on the fiddle I mean without having frets like you can put the note wherever you want um, I I love to hear like sharp notes sometimes yeah the 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 high B that's on the E string is often flat you know f partly I think for sort of similar reasons like I have a really short pinky mm. and and so for me like it just it's just more comfortable. To yeah. not reach all the way up to like to put the B note. I mean, I can do it, but it's just more comfortable not to do it, you know. And, and so, it's just sort of, sort of flavor anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I was struck by the. I mean, I, I I can't go back to hear everybody playing it, but I was struck by how deliberately that was uh, uh, articulated by both Manko Sneed and um, Marcus Martin in just the the contrast between the. A and the B section, um, where it's not there is a there is a microtonal thing. Or there's a there's a there's some vagueness, but it's not vague that there's a F sharp in the B section, right? And, and and so, but it's quite clear that it's not the same note in the A section. So, you know, I, I like that it's so. I like that those versions are both solo fiddle, um, but I also would be curious to hear, uh, you know, some accompaniment uh, right. along with from that era and I haven't heard that yet. Yeah, like what would Yeah uh, Marcus Martin's if that if he were recorded with a guitarist playing that tune, what would they play? Yeah, or a banjo um, player. Or a banjo player. Yeah. Yeah, I mean a guitar player I, I you know, I, I just find that often the guitar players the fiddle players that are these incredible fiddle players I know there's great guitar players too, but a lot of these fiddle players that I've gotten to hear are, they'll just go along with it. They're like, yeah, whatever. I'll just keep playing my tune. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the guitarist is doing. They're not going change, right. to change too much what they're doing, um, both either rhythmically or harmonically, from what I've heard. Um, but but it would be neat to hear somebody playing an instrument that had a little, uh, I don't know, like they could dodge a little bit, like on banjo or ukulele or something like that. Or dulcimer maybe, or dulcimer, <laughs> or, or a dulcimer maybe. Yeah, there's not that. There's not as much as I'd like to hear of. of yeah, what what dulcimer would do? I mean, pretty much we're limited though. <laughs> We'd just be doing F sharp. That'd be that. Are there any like old recordings with dulcimer as accompaniment, like as a, to a fiddle? Not much. It's not much, right? Not much. There's solo. Yeah, there's a good amount of solo. No, I know that. Yeah, yeah, but like mostly with the noter. Right. And um, yeah, and yeah. I mean, I remember. I, I remember in college finding a, a really old um, uh, you know, black and white cover r record that I can't remember what it was called, but it was something, it wasn't Smithsonian either. It wasn't Folkways. I don't know what it was, but I remember it being a very odd. It almost looked like a church um, album that was produced by, you know, one manufacturer and it was like a hundred yeah. albums kind of thing. And it was Appalachian music. And there are three noter Appalachian tunes on it. And they were really fast, like Amazing Grace, super fast. Huh. And it was just all the same note, like, you know, A, 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 and going up and down really fast. And it, when I figured out halfway through what they were doing, and I already had a dulcimer, I was like, oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. And then 
later tried to find more stuff. <clears throat> of course, this was the 90s that I was looking for stuff. And most of what I found would have been stuff from the 70s, 60s. You know, it was really hard to find. So then I just started <clears throat> listening to just fiddle. Um, right. Playing along with that stuff. And I, I kind of lost the tra train of finding. I kind of gave up on finding fiddle, uh, fiddle dulcimer um, duets or even fiddle guitar dulcimer. I just didn't hear it. So, yeah, I'm mostly I mean, familiar with lap dulcimer mm -hmm. as a uh, solo. I guess as a as a folk revival instrument, mm -hmm. but I know that people had and yeah. played them. But yeah. I guess for whatever reason, in the field recording or like the you know folk folk music industry pre revival, mm -hmm. it was just yeah. like under uh, prioritized. Mm -hmm. As far as I as far as I know, yeah, there's, there's some, not a slippery hill of dulcimer, right? But there, there, yeah. Alan, Alan Lomax had some good stuff with singers and solo stuff that he recorded, mm. but I don't, I couldn't name any of those people right now. It was all like one-off tunes that were on a, a sampler. Who did yeah. you learn from? How did you learn? Like, why did, and why do you not use a noter? Can you know. explain I, this? I'm I'm not, I'm unfamiliar with this term. Noters, yeah. Noter? What's that? Um. It's like, uh, ooh, um, so like, you know, as you got, as you know, you, you got it, you've got all the notes. You don't have all the notes. You just have a diatonic, you know, like that. Yeah. It actually has the, what you call the F or the F, you know, the flat and the major seven on this one. But traditionally they just have a, the flat seven. Um, really? Just the yeah. flat seven traditionally. Interesting. And that's weird. It's because usually it's uh, fourth. It's getting too nerdy, but no. Usually it's is... usually the middle string. Yeah. Is actually let's just say it's we're in D right now. This would be D G D. So the middle middle note is actually the the tonic. That would make sense. Why the frets would be set right. up that way. So yeah. then it would be a, a major scale. Right. That's what you would have. Yeah. But if I'm playing uh, in... But yeah, that, that's all you need to know. <laughs> well, you yeah. saw tell about describe noter, noter, though. Yeah, so the noter is... I mean, my thumbnail is going to act as a noter, but a pencil could act as a noter. You just, like, literally hold a pencil down or a peg, like yeah. a peg you'd put in here, and, and just go up and down. Do you have a pencil or anything? Yeah. So it's kind of like a slide, like playing. Yeah, slide like a guitar. beer bottle on a gu guitar. Yeah, guitar. but it's it's actually kind of different because um, it's got a little bit of a um, what's the word? Is this right? Yeah. So here's a pen, like actual. This is my Bic round stick. Gear, gear talk. This is great. That's right. So um, so if I was gonna do like. Uh, I'm just pushing down on it. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Thanks for That's including another and, Christmas tune in there. It's and, and, you know, <laughs> actually, a lot of dulcimers that I've seen, because I've had... Over the years, people that hang these on their wall and don't ever play them, which because they're yeah. kind of artifacts of the past, people have brought them to me, and I've accepted most of them. But then I, ha I've given them to other people or whatever. A lot of them only have the frets on the top mm. because they don't ever fret anything else. They don't go all the way. They don't go past no. like the first octave or whatever. No, they don't. Uh, sorry, the fret doesn't go all the way across. Oh, I yeah. didn't understand. When you said the top, I didn't know which direction. Sorry, yeah, yeah. To. So they just, because they only are fretting this right here. So you have a constant drum. Right. And because they're not doing these points. like, no, these like spider shapes. You right. Know, you're you not doing anything with yeah. your, you're just using that note. And, uh, and so then you commit to that. And that's really like, you know, Don Petty, who's just wonderful, obviously, um, his, his playing, um, He's pretty faithful to trying to stick to the upper, upper string um, and really m match all the articulation of, of the fiddle, or just you know, complement it by just playing on the top string. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's a it's haunting, 
it's a haunting sound. It emphasizes the the double stops of the fiddle and um, brings out the mis- the mystery because you're you're essentially people often say, "Well, you're not playing chords," but actually, what you're doing is you're playing constantly. You're playing all kinds of crazy chords. Yeah, you know, <laughs> absolutely. If you wrote out what's happening by just playing a G and a D beneath all these other notes, there's a lot of really crazy chords you're you're playing. Yeah. I have a, a similar experience playing the banjo. Yeah, exactly. It's very similar. But yeah. it, it, it's so it's like the banjo and like, you know, that there's all these different tunings, but the door is even further wide open. You know, like we a lot of the we 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 spend a fair amount of time like as a duo with Rob just trying to figure out like the right combination of of tuning and like where to capo it yes. and which of his dulcimers to use. Yeah. Uh, and things like that. So it and yeah. we have to remember them. <laughs> it's like something- yeah, we've done that a lot. We showed up in the studio with the money, you know, money going out the door, <laughs> and we're like, "I swear, I think I capoed this one and had it in C F C or was it B flat? Like, I don't know. Oh, try that." And then he's like, "No," and like he'll remember something that I forgot. Yeah, you have to like do some long division on a pad and paper, like yeah. <laughs> pad of paper, <laughs> like to no remember. kidding. Yeah. <laughs> and then when we when like we recorded with Bragger out in California last June or July. June, we, uh, yeah, we, I had to think about string gauges. Mm-hmm. You know, we're heading we out there. Played, we played down in B. So I had to like read, re, like, okay, let's play these six tunes first because I got to put on these heavier strings for these other tunes. Yeah. yeah. And I guess Which you I weren't like checking a bunch of dulcimers like on right. the plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if it was if we were recording here, it wouldn't have been an issue, but. Yeah. 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 When you when you show up with a big big rifle case with a dulcimer in it at the at the air, airport, you know, yeah, they they'll let that. one through, but they won't let two through. Yeah, <laughs> the, but the upshot of of uh, part of this is that like for certain tunes, like if if I think of the tune and we say the tune, we're gonna play the tune. Like the first thing that comes to my mind is CFC Capo One. It's <laughs> just like Rob's Rob's dulcimer setup. It's like oh, you can also do that tune. Yeah. He sees it on the set list. Like the set list doesn't have anything except for my tuning. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I've i seen fiddlers start like fiddlers at jams and festivals have, yeah. you know, different levels of understanding of what the hell the banjo player needs in order mm-hmm. like, I want yeah. to play this tune next. Yeah. Uh, how much time would that take? <laughs> like, how yeah. long would I have to wait? Is it worth it? You know, <laughs> and, and di- you know, different fiddlers have like developed that kind of intuition around banjo players, or or are willfully obtuse. Uh, they yeah. they refuse to understand. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I appreciate that in your duo, Jason, you've had to adapt for the specific constraints yeah. of the dulcimer. You obviously think it's worth it. And I profoundly agree. <laughs> it sounds so good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so like, unlike those kinds of jams, you know, that you'll have a cliff top where you'll, everybody plays in like the key of a for one hour and then moves to the key of D for the next hour. Um, because Rob plays so many different instruments and for our shows usually would have more than one dulcimer. Like we actually, we actually change keys if possible, like every tune, tune just to, you know, for, yeah. to, for, for purposes of the show. And even when we play together for fun, it's, it's sort of mostly like that. Like mm-hmm. the, um, and a lot of that's Rob's influence too. Like I think Rob has a, has a, um, yeah, yes, that's true. A good sense as, as kind of more, a little bit more of an outsider to old time music of like what makes a good show for people who are not really into old time music. Um, mm. We're only into old time music, and um, and so you know, just in terms of like variety of keys and variety of tunes and and things. I mean, it's stuff that I, I feel like I am sensitive to too. Mm-hmm. But but Rob is more, you know, just more better at. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Rob. Jason has told me that you have an interesting perspective on yeah. the world of old time music. Yeah, you're the first person to tell me that Jason has told me that, <laughs> <laughs> and that I should. T- I talk to you about that and you know uh maybe that would be even worth like a whole other interview uh hmm. sometime when we're both in the same city but um it might take that long to find out what that perspective is oh come on yeah <laughs> <laughs> just kidding i i would imagine that maybe would you, do you would you say that you have a like a primary instrument hmm? like is like dulcimer like yeah, your 
It's funny you say that. J- Jason basically asked me that when we were trying to decide what kind of music we were going to play together. Because we, we were at this house in Athens where Jason moved to directly from New York. And it was clear that I loved playing with him. We, we, we felt like we could do a lot of things together. And we had previously done some playing together in a different project, like many years before that. And, uh, but didn't know each other very well. And I was like, what do you want to do? Like, we, we, let's do something. Cause we're both, we both have small kids. We can't realistically do much, uh, in terms of traveling, but what do you want to play? And he, he was like, well, I remember one of his follow-up questions, we were walking down Boulevard where I live. Yeah. He was like, what, what, what's your main instrument? Like, what do you want to play? Cause he'd heard me play everything, but he just didn't know what I considered it. Yeah. And I was like, honestly, definitely guitar, like a hundred percent electric guitar. Like, no doubt. However, in terms of what I can offer, you know, the musical canon of the world and, and him, I would say definitely dulcimer. Yeah. So, um, so, and then he was like, okay, cool. And then that was kind of it. And it wasn't like we then started just playing that. He just wanted to know. And it, it helped me clarify, like, in this context, what I was going to do. Because, I mean, I, you know, we play with Beverly Smith, a guitar player and singer and fiddle player and all that. I completely 100% recognize what she's what she intuitively wants to do on guitar that is wonderful and uh I'm like wow that's that's I have a lot to learn. Um and when it comes to dulcimer I know there's a lot of great dulcimer players out there but for playing this kind of music mm. I definitely feel like I'm discovering it completely um on my own. Um yeah. and I don't think that's being irreverent. I just feel like anybody that has discovered how to play dulcimer with this kind of music has essentially discovered it on their own. Yeah. It's, there's not exactly a, a template Mm-mm. Mm-mm. or a no. code <laughs> to no. switch to in, yeah. in a, in a jam, you know, mm. but, but, you know, I, it's really, I, I more feel like uh, when Jason, when Jason comes up with tunes that he's interested in doing for our, kind of our next, like at, cause we, you know, you can imagine it's just two of us. So we actually do a mass, like a big, list of tunes that we're familiar with playing and that's i guess it's kind of like having an old time jam in your in your town where you're like oh these are the tunes people play but it's quite focused because i know what tunes he wants to play with me and so we have all these tunes and then right when i hear them he's kind of open to sending me 20 tunes or playing 20 tunes for me and me saying like i like all 20 of these or i like two of these he's like whatever because he's just going to keep playing tunes and and but if I like something, can't help myself. Can't help himself. <laughs> so, but if I if I like something, and I say, can you play me some of those sources, or or maybe he just sends me sources. Like he'll sometimes say, like I, I'm interested in this tune, and I'll come at it at it from a different perspective. But one of the first things I'll do once we get together, of course, is just ask him, like, what do you hear on this? What do you what do you hear? And usually he says, I don't know. What do you hear? <laughs> and I'm like, let me try dulcimer. And he's usually like, that sounds cool. Yeah. And then, then if it doesn't feel great, well, we basically just have a dialogue after that. And it's like, you know, I w- I'd like to actually try this in a different key on ukulele, you know, because I want it to drive or whatever. Yeah. But I feel like the fiddle, that's the thing is I feel like the fiddle tunes are like, you know, they're really, it's it's a cliche, but they're, they're diamonds in the rough. And they, you just basically, you know, you, you try to bring them out and then like make them live. And that's all Jason's job. But I can tell him how I hear it differently and it can change the way he's interpreting it. But then I just want to set it. I, I just want to help set it so that what he's doing, he can be more free huh. in some of the original um, some of the original uh, idiosyncrasies of the tune can come out because of what I put beneath it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It almost reminds me of... Uh, oh, I wish I remembered his name. He's a... Northern Washington State old time mm-hmm. musician uh, that I met once at a at a jam at someone's house randomly, but he was saying that his whole job mm-hmm. is making like pedestals mm-hmm. for sculptures at museums. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like a whole other like I guess it's technically more craft than art, but arguably mm-hmm. it's like equally important because mm-hmm. it's like. We want to be able to see this this sculpture uh, or I think maybe he also did frame and also like, yeah, it's like 
the art itself is obviously important, but it's like, what, how are we going to present it and what is around it? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. and I think that's an interesting, an interesting posture to have towards the music. And I love the idea of that informing how Jason will continue to like, you know, interpret the tunes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'll just say one more thing just to, to, say how I do that, that metaphor works for me is that I, the picture of the tunes are very linear and they're very curve, curvilinear. They're very curvy. Sure. And a lot of the original recordings, uh, that we hear, the oldest recordings we hear, um, are surprisingly not, not boxy, not, not, uh, mathematical. Yeah. And so there's all this expression that varies. It, flows like this way and it and it bounces in different ways and so instead of me holding up this object right it's like figuring out how can i keep that flowing and keep it bouncing along and and allow him to bounce yeah in a in a way that the the fiddle players would have would have done it by themselves like they're bouncing off of they they could take their time but they also want to do it that way it's not like they're like oh i'm just i just can't seem to play on n4 so I'm going to add a beat <laughs> here, but not there. It's really like how they're feeling playing it. It is a thousand percent what they wanted to do for a lot of these fiddle players, regardless of how old they were. Right. And um, and so when if we are excited by one of those versions, then the worst thing I could do would be to box it into something less interesting. Sure. And the best thing I could do would be to allow him to feel what it's like to be in that um, frame of mind. Yeah. Well, let's uh, play another. Let's yeah. play another uh, tune, either old Maybe time or Christmas or combination. Yeah, let's do, definitely do a dulcimer one. I mean, should we do that, Lu Lulai Lule or whatever it's called? Yeah, sure, sure. Let's do that one. So Rob will do this. Will, this will be a good little like, solo dulcimer moment um, for this tune that you, My, you this guys is, can remember. But yeah, well, you and I both heard it when we were kids. I guess I were some, at some point. My my mom used to sing this as a lullaby for mm. sure, not all the time, yeah. but it was like this and Pretty Little Horses were two that I liked a lot because they had that interesting thing. Did she sing all the verses? This song is intense. We're gonna do it instrumentally, but I don't know. If she sang all the verses, but she sang enough where it was like a, a, a full l- lullaby. If if I remember right, it's a song about like uh, Herod's like you know genocide oh, like pre pre Jesus. If I, I knew there was right. blood. I knew there was blood in it. And I yeah, actually I, I remember her saying it's not really she said something like no I don't know. I remember associating it with Easter and I was like, hmm. I was huh. dubious. But yeah. I don't remember Herod's name in it. But it I, I should have looked it up before I learned. We literally right now, when we're about to play this, just came up with the idea definitely like a minute before we recorded it. Yeah. I think yeah, it flows really nicely because you're going to do it with, is it the Bi- the Bayard Ray Polly put the kettle on? Yeah. 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 I haven't played that one before. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll pick it up. It's a little different. <laughs> it is. Marcus yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we probably talked about it last time I was on the show. Um, yeah. So I'll give the, I'll give the shortest possible version, but basically Bard Ray could not learn it properly from Manco Steed. Um, or Marcus and Martin. how would you? He's just gonna say it. He's just gonna <laughs> <That> say it. <laughs> and and so what he actually came up with is just as good, if not better, as as the version they played. Um, but but definitely a little bit different. And um, there's a whole controversy out there about somebody calling it Bard's Polly's Mountain Kettle or Bard's Mountain Kettle or something like that. But basically, he it's Sounds the very same tune that he. <laughs> Believe me, Cameron. You live Lots on the internet. You live on the internet too. You there's there, there's a controversy. If there's <laughs> if there's a disagreement, there's a controversy. Um. So yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll play that after, and we've been playing that for years. And actually, um, we we tried to record this on our, on, I think for maybe our very first CD together. Yeah. It's on it's on our website. Yeah, volume one, a, Hog Eyed Man uh, Volume One. Uh-huh. Hog Eyed Man One, and it's on you can hear the version that we tried for that on our website. Um and and then later Rob figured out um a different tuning, which happened to be CFC Capo One. 
Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and apparently the sexiest work, one for Jason. Works much better, but he's not going to play that in that in that. Right. Tuning. He's going to go back to the same tuning that he used that we rejected for Hog Eyed Man yeah. One and see if it works with you, Cameron. That's right. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. And w- and I guess when you're saying capo one, it would be <laughs> bringing it up to. G- yeah, so GD. DGD, but then think DGD. about it. You're on. You're in Aeoli, or you're sorry. You're in Dor- Dorian. That makes sense. No, doesn't matter. Uh, you're, Aeoli, you're you're starting Aeoli mode. From, yeah, you're you're starting from instead of Do Re Mi, you're starting from Re. Oh, yeah, yeah. For, so I, that would make sense for yeah, yeah. I guess for this for this version because unlike the. Marcus Martin. I don't know what the hell Mako Sneed is doing on this source, but the Marcus Martin one, he has a real f- sort of flirty back and forth. Oh, Bart Race nat- is even more flirty. <laughs> yeah. It's da 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 It's it's cool. You don't need all those notes though on the banjo. No, you don't. I'll see what I can which ones I can grab. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's do it. Um, that was fun. That was really fun, Cameron. <laughs> that that was great. What just happened <laughs> in real and, time? And I wanted to say, like, um, you know, when I was when when Rob was talking before about the the way he plays different instruments with me and kind of like how he supports the music, like the way that I play the fiddle tune really changes a lot depending on which instrument Rob is using. Yeah, um, how, I mean, I guess that's sort of obvious in some ways, but like if he's playing guitar and what he's and you know he's just like has has big chords going behind it, um, then I, I will tend to probably like do melodic variations that I wouldn't do otherwise. Um, whereas when he's playing dulcimer and he's really playing the melody along with, you know, ch- chordal ideas the whole time, like we, I, that's, that's, a, that's my favorite. And one of the reasons that's my favorite um, thing to do 
is that we listen to each other and we're like very we, we'll do harmonic things around each other like we'll do octave things around each other yeah and the kinds of variations i that i do will be i think way more subtle in some yeah. ways and same for you probably mm -hmm. too yeah um but there's a lot of harmonic ambiguity to it um and you know there's a reason that that's a, why that's what we do the most and it's because you know it's i think it's the most unique thing that we do um and it's the thing that i just get the best vibe from mm -hmm. when we're doing it mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's and, it's exciting to hear two instruments uh interpret a tune um in the way that is idiomatic to those instruments and the players who are <laughs> also instruments uh and then to hear the like uh sometimes play yeah, sometimes it's like an argument, you know, mm -hmm. like sometimes yeah. it's like a fight, sometimes it's um yeah, uh, the opposite, <laughs> whatever mm -hmm. the opposite you, whatever metaphor you want to use. Uh mm -hmm. and uh it's either either way it's really exciting. I mean, it's like what you were saying, Rob, about like guitar choices. Mm -hmm. Uh and it's like what's going on here? Is it like parallel play, <laughs> you right. know, or is it like um are the is, is there sort of like a how much how much communication and then what do you do with the things that are being communicated? Like how much do you change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I enjoy the, uh, I can tell that you two think a lot about what the other is playing and, mm -hmm. and that that affects what you're doing. Mm -hmm. No doubt. And, and it's similar when, when Rob plays mandolin and we do a duet, that's just, mm -hmm. you know, mandolin and, and fiddle, which most of the time will be Rob playing a, a cross tuned, mandolin and, and i'll be playing cross tuned fiddle um i don't guess we're not gonna do that tonight but yeah but um uh and, mm -hmm. and sometimes we do standard it? but anyway it's, it's a similar kind of idea where it's just like you know the the, the kinds of variations that you would do need to be tighter they need yeah. to like be something that the other person that's going to work with or you're expecting the other person to do whereas you know if, if somebody's just playing chords uh, on on guitar, piano, or something else like that. Like, there's just so much more freedom, and so every once in a while, it's nice to have that freedom and mm -hmm. kind of feel like I can really do whatever I want on the fiddle. Yeah. And um, but mostly, it's just it's so much more interactive. Yeah. to kind of like listen to each other. And, yeah, and I I would imagine you know if you're if you're listening, I, I'd imagine if you're listening to like <clears throat> really good Irish music. Um that's not doesn't have many chordal instruments or any chordal instruments in it that you know it's part of the thrill of it is uh the sort of organic and completely wild um notes that intertwine with each other and and, and are tight but not um not exactly synchron yeah, yeah not perfectly synchronized or yeah yeah that that you have these moments that it comes out and comes right back and it so it's tight and loose at the same time, and and I know that that you know Jason plays a lot of that music, and I I played used to, yeah. used to and I played I've played enough uh, in sessions to um to to experience that thrill, and I think that's certainly part of uh, what makes uh, playing mandolin and dulcimer have that thrill for me is is doubling the melody, but doubling an idea of what the melodies could be. The uh... Twenty thousand dollar word that I've that I've heard for that, and I call it twenty thousand dollars because that's how much money I'm still in debt for my music theory degree. Uh, <laughs> is uh, heterophony, huh? Uh, the idea of two voices, yeah. in, you know, whatever instrument interpreting the same melody but having different pathways. Wow. You know, whether it's about the like the skill or the um, idea yeah. of what the tune is or the limitations of the instrument. Um, well, and yeah, I agree Jason that, that I, it's so exciting. <laughs> to we're hear. definitely in a heterophonous relationship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fully I would committed. say it's, it's fully committed. Yeah. And, and I really mean it. Like I, I need, I need heterophonous relationships. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just it's go on it's one of my favorite like hetero things. I think. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, of, of the hetero things, it's got to be near the top. Yeah, yeah. I wish I wish that's what heteronormity heteronormativity was about. Was about. I think heteronormativity would be worse than what you're thinking. It is. It's when you have to play exactly the same notes together all the time. <laughs> that would be awful. <laughs> anyway, all right. Maybe yeah. before we we got one more tune, and then 
we can talk about do a little business where people go to like buy your albums and mm-hmm. uh, things like that, and then we'll we'll finish with a tune, and then we'll include a, a bonus track for everyone because it's Christmas. Uh, not ju- it's not just Christmas for the Patreon subscribers. Um, <laughs> so, but before we do that, let's like do a little bit of a little bit of Christmas talk. What you're both parents and it sounds like you both grew up with Christmas and like you're both still doing Christmas and I'm a parent and I had Christmas happen to me and I'm making Christmas happen to my kids <laughs> and trying to figure out what that's going to look like. And I'm, mm-hmm. I guess I'm curious, did you have any, what were like Christmas traditions for you that you've decided like these ones I'm going to pass on, you know, despite maybe Christmas meaning something different to you now than it did then, if it does. Yeah. I'm curious if you, if you have any perspective on that, especially in terms of like presenting Christmas to new beings. Oh, so you're actually looking for advice, Cameron. Yeah. This is the podcast within the podcast. Cause I always, <laughs> I always ask people who have musical yeah. kids, yeah. Um, well, how do I make my kids not hate music? Uh, yeah. and so this yeah. is like the Christmas edition of that. That's great. Well, I mean, I, I do think that in, in terms of, this is a very general statement, but you know, when I am, t- I, I'm a teacher like Jason, Jason and I both teach, we both do different things, but, um, we both do some teaching in the classroom yeah. and, it's easiest with people that have Christmas in their lives um, as part of their family traditions. uh, It's, it's easy to talk about what folk traditions and folk music are in various parts of the world um, by talking just about Christmas and saying around that time of year, you know how you sing a song and somebody else knows the words and doesn't matter if they're 90 years old or six, they can sing together. Yeah. That's how human beings have been communicating for 15,000 years. And only recently is it not really the case. Uh, right. So I, that's my perspective on it is that, is that it's a folk holiday and it's got all the trappings of all folk holidays. It's got some completely offensive stuff in it and some gold in it. And, um, you know, find a folk tradition where that's not the case. <laughs> Sure. Uh, and, and and I'm saying that because I like my son and Jason's one of Jason's sons is taking piano with the same piano teacher. Mm-hmm. When it hits October, this woman Yasna, uh, she's like, uh, "All right, it's time to start working on your Christmas tunes, kid. That's your job. You know, yeah, your job is to be able to accompany these otherwise illiterate musician musical people in the world." Yeah. That only know Christmas tunes, you know, so we all need to be able to sing together. And so you got to start working on that in October. So for me, it's like, it's also like one of the only times that non-musicians are all going to get to sing and play and travel around together and go door to door. Yeah. So I challenge you, Cameron, to do everything you can to go door to door. Okay. Sing to people. Mm. Or at least just go sing for other people with, with your family. That's a great point because like, especially as, um, outside of church, yeah, like, which is like more, more and more people are not participating in that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. non-musicians don't have places to go do music together. Right. Communal and they singing. always love it when they do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a great point. Like, like Christmas is like one of the last bastions of yeah. like folk folk music happening with mm-hmm. e- like actual folk music. Like everyone yeah. doing it. Yeah. Well, not everyone, obviously, but a lot of people. It's ubiquitous yeah. enough. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. I'll think about that. Uh, I I was raised in like a very religious expression of Christmas, yeah. along with all of the <laughs> folk and. Mm-hmm capitalist <laughs> expressions of Christmas, you know? And uh, it's been something I've been thinking about, you know, cause it's yeah. like when I'm doing Christmas with my kids, it's like, I don't, I don't think we're going to read mm-hmm. 
the nativity story from the Bible because yeah. <laughs> that's what I grew up with like yeah, every year on Christmas Eve with grandma, you yeah. know, it's like, but what am I going to do with them? Because I do, I don't want to get rid of it because mm-hmm. it's, you know, uh, how mm-hmm. much high context culture do I get to have? <laughs> <laughs> I should, I should hold on to as much as I can stomach. Yeah. And I think I have a little bit more room in my heart for Christmas <laughs> than some of the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have a ton to add um, to what to what Rob said, but, you know, like my, my son, the same son who takes piano, actually, he's eight. Um, he also plays violin and he, he loves piano, but he does not love violin. Um, but he loves to play Christmas carols on his violin and he can like pick it up and he, and he never starts the tune on the same you know note. So it's always a different key that he plays it in, but his, his ears he's hearing super good. It. Yeah. And, he, he it doesn't matter. He just plays it, and he can play yeah. like ten of them, um, you know, in one in one go. Um, so so it's you know I think it's just it's like it's like these basic fiddle tunes basically, mm-hmm. you know, and and they're so accessible. And when you when you sing them with other people, it's like such a joyful experience. Like singing with other people always is. Mm-hmm. Um, so so yeah, I mean, you know, I grew up Quaker, but my me too. Did we talk about this? I don't think we really talked about it, but I remembered that you said you were Quaker. So, yeah. um, so we, so a moment ago, I was like, "Wait a minute! Didn't Quick? Didn't Cameron say he was Quaker? Like, yeah. how come his parents pushed this, pushed religious Christmas?" Well, that's so the hard? thing. We were evangelical friends, which is like what I guess most Quakers in the world are now. Get right. They're mostly in like Kenya and Uganda and Newburgh, Oregon, oh. uh, and they like have like pastors and stuff. It's just like mainline oh. Protestant church. No with way. a little bit of kind of Quakerism that's in it, that's sort of rapidly dying out. It's I see. Interesting. Uh, okay. Well, I grew up much more old school Quaker or hippie Quaker or whatever it was. Like sure. just yeah. You know, no, 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 no sort of master of ceremonies. Um, yeah. Lots of singing, lots of silence, um, and then people like speaking from the heart when it moved them. Um, that said, like we always celebrated Christmas. Like mm-hmm. even in the Quaker, I remember like you know one at least one year in our Quaker meeting you know, me and other kids like acting out the nativity scene and, and yeah and things like that. So it's a piece of it, you know, of course, but yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> the commercialism is, is a little hard to take, but you know, that's our, that's our world. Yeah. Yeah. I don't necessarily, I mean, I like some of it. I don't know. I'm, a, we're going to, I mean, I, this is a funny example. We're going to, at some point watch the, Charlie Brown Christmas. Oh, it's but that's good, about yeah. but it's about commercialism. Right. <laughs> and so is the Christmas story, it's the same thing. Yeah. You know, like the that movie, I mean. The, oh, the of Christmas course, yeah. Story. Yeah. It's yeah. it's like the perfect American story. It's it's just like hilariously materialistic. <laughs> um, but you know like our friend the place that we play often uh called Hendershots in Athens. You know, they take that they take that uh Charlie Brown album and they play it with a trio Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday night. And they, and they do that. And like all the kids in Athens that they come in, they bring their sleeping yeah. bags and they it's sit down awesome. and they have eggnog and drink coffee. Uh, and I asked my kids the other day, this, this way it speaks to this. I asked my kids the other day, like, Hey, I know that COVID was last year and we couldn't do the thing. I mean, like in terms of we weren't allowed to go into the yeah. bar. Um, but this year, you're vaccinated, and we're gonna. There's gonna be masks, and there's gonna be vaccines, and everything. Uh, would you want to go to see Seth and the band, the Good Grief Trio, yep. play? And also, they had the full <laughs> chorus of they had the, the whole chorus of of people singing the songs, right? Yeah, and it's, it's just in this old club. It's so good. We all we all go. It's every year, and 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 like it's just like warm and all that. But I said, do you want to go? And and my son was, my son who could easily say no or he, i yeah. didn't know what he was going to say he's like is it really is it really something for me to answer and i was like yeah it's up to you and he's like it's a tradition like he's yeah. kind of like uh didn't that what you do you know yeah <laughs> and so i feel like you know yeah. the more the more time the more things you can have around any holiday but especially christmas and thanksgiving and some other ones you know like where it's people getting together and having traditions it's this great so yeah yeah well thanks for the advice we're gonna do the we're gonna do the christmas uh get up in the cool show every 
every year now. Yeah, it'll be a tradition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, speaking of that, uh, we were trying to do this last year. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, we, we weren't able to make it happen for a mixture of me coming up with the idea too late. Cause I did a Christmas episode the, the, the year before with the Hawkinson sisters. Uh, and I was like, I should do that again, but it occurred to me way too late. And, uh, you two, I, I hope you feel very flattered. You are the, I, I basically we made a vow flattered. as soon as I got my vaccine, I was just like, I'm not doing another remote ap- episode. Right. <laughs> like it is not worth it. And then I was like, Unless, <laughs> unless Hawkeye <laughs> Man is willing to do a Christmas episode with me, I will spend the time That's essentially great. making a holiday EP with you two. <laughs> so this weekend, well, I guess. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, just to be clear, like we we've turned down some streaming concerts. We were like, <laughs> we're not doing another streaming Hawkeye Man thing again, yeah. unless. Cameron gets back to us yes. and invites us to be on the holiday <laughs> episode. <laughs> huh. Well, let's play another tune. What's All up right. next? Um, let's see. You want to do the the bring a torch, Jeanette, Isabella, and and uh, I some Monday's Christmas Eve. I was I was wondering. Okay, hold on. Is it? Yep. Have I been saying it wrong this whole time? Probably. I've been saying I've been saying Isham. No. It's Isham. It's Isham. <gasps> yeah. Interesting. Is yeah, that just I, I, how people from his region say that name, or is that the only way that name is pronounced? And no, he's the only one that I knew. Yeah, no, I, I've only heard Isom from there. You you heard Isom before too? I've only heard Isom from that region. Isom. Okay. I, cool. I don't know, right. but, but I know a kid named Isham that lives in Athens. Right. So yeah, it's not the only way those letters can be pronounced. Um, <laughs> of course. But yeah, Bruce Bruce Green says if you're going to play his music, you may as well say his name right. And he, he he taught me long ago how to say the name right. I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Uh, the Christmas Eve tune. I've never heard that before, and it's oh, gorgeous. Oh yeah? yeah. Yeah, it's great. I love that. Oh, it's great. Those yeah. recordings are incredible. Like it just so he's such a powerful fiddle player. <laughs> You know, yeah, we've talked about him so many times, Rob and I. It's like, you know, he's one of our muses for sure. Um, Bruce Green or Isom? Isom. Yeah. I mean, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce obviously Bruce. Bruce too, is, the, is my my north star, but but yeah. um, you know, Isom is definitely one of our main sources. And yeah, um, it's like if John Henry Woodcut playing the fiddle, you know, just, <laughs> you know Muhammad you, Ali. I mean, people rag on Isom Monday and and Hiram Stamper and. Um, they They're just don't get favorites. it, you know, it's They're my like, two favorites. they, uh, the, the what, what Rob, Rob said this one time, but like, you know, they, cause they, I mean, Isa Monday has some really powerful playing and, and Hiram Stamper was just too old by the time he was recorded. But, um, for, for them, for John Sawyer, for all of them, like what's paramount is the rhythm. And yeah. so the temp, the, the, the tempo that they set is, 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 is so that they can still do the same kind of rhythmic thing that they've always wanted to do at like whatever speed they play the tune. Yeah. yeah. Why do people rag on Ice of Monday? I don't know these people, but please don't introduce them to me. <laughs> yeah. That's a thing? And Hiram Stamper too? Definitely Hiram Stamper. I, you know, it's just the more, fo- I think it, part of it's just like the more foreign the music sounds to like modern aesthetics, the, the, yeah. uh, easy, e- you know, the, the more to criticize maybe or, or to not understand. Um, I'm trying yeah, to I think figure it's... out on which on which side of old time pretension, you know, is this <laughs> is this coming from? Is this the like too cool for school old time no, or is this the like or, or on the other side, maybe? Um. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, every time I've every time I've. And it's over now because I don't think I'll ever hear another Hiram or Isom that I Oops. haven't yet heard. <clears throat> but um, every time I've rediscovered them, I'm just like, oh, man, this is so great. Um, it, I really it, wish there was a treasure trove somewhere. And I I, yeah. I, I don't know. There probably is. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, the first tune we recorded together was an Isom Monday tune, Apple Blossom. Um, and so a lot of times when we record his tunes, we, we play them down in B also, which is where, hmm. we, where we should do this now, Cameron. Great. Um, is did did he tune? Okay, when you say down in B, I'm assuming you mean a down tuned. Yeah. Is it like are we playing a C tune? A D tune. 
a detune tune down. Oh, yeah, like be... uh, all the like Darley Folks. Darley Folks is always like playing some down of those. Too. Yeah, he doesn't go to yeah. quite as not not quite as low, but yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, actually, there's not consensus about Darley Folks in that way. Like so, some uh, there, there's just I, I think there's less consensus about whether he's actually playing in C versus uh. like detune down to C. Interesting. Um, okay. But but anyway, for 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 Ice on Monday, you know, he plays a lot of tunes just down in the key of, you know, D D tunes down in the key of B or A tunes down in the key of F or G or F sharps, you know, somewhere around there. Great. Okay, I'll figure out what I want to do on my end <laughs> in order to participate <laughs> in that, I guess. <laughs> I'll yeah. figure something out. <laughs> yeah, you will. Yeah. yeah, so we'll do we'll do um that that old French carol Bring a torch, Jeanette Isabella, which is actually my mom's favorite Christmas carol, which is one of the oh, reasons yeah. I wanted to play that. Um, that and then, also a a deeper cut Christmas carol. Yep. I don't know what that carol's supposed to be a, about. Like, who's Jeanette Isabella, and why does she it, have it, a torch? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't remember the story. I've heard the. I've heard it sung before. Um, it's 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 definitely in in the like nativity canon it's something about you know the birth of jesus oh so it's like bible fan fiction i think so uh, fan fiction what yeah. <laughs> because like, like jeanette the, <laughs> jeanette it's Isabella. like from the 1700s or something though well i'm saying like yeah, jeanette okay. there wouldn't be someone named jeanette isabella in like <laughs> uh jerusalem or <laughs> right or yeah. Na- nazareth i guess good yeah. point yeah yeah good point <laughs> that's like a french <laughs> yeah, the Frenchest name I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to Wikipedia after we're done. See yeah, what the story is on it. Yeah, I think but so. Old, yeah, though. like yeah. the cherry tree carol. It's like right. I don't think they had cherry trees. <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. I don't think we're we're not doing that one today. That's the one where Joseph like slut shames, uh, uh, the Virgin Mary because he assumes that it wasn't God who did it. And uh, and then, basically, like God magically lowers down a, a the bough of a cherry tree so that she can have a cherry, and like to put Joseph in his place or something. <laughs> there's some sort, <laughs> there's some sort of like paternal paternity test drama involved, and they made a carol out of it. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, I I love the imagination. <laughs> That yeah. goes into this stuff. there's a whole um there's a whole other book um it's in the it's in like some early renaissance i mean it's well known to catholics uh from the 14 15 and 16 1700s but the golden legend do you heard about that no so the golden legend is kind of like the backstory of joseph's family and huh. and and it's but it's on the walls of like uh Giotto's cathedral in uh rome and like it's as much of the iconography of medieval Renaissance um, art as like the Gospels for some churches, and it's like not the Bible; it's just the Golden Legend. Yeah. And it was written quite a bit later. <laughs> it, would, it would be more likely to have somebody like Jeanette Isabella in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, arguably, it's all it's all fan fiction, the Bible included. <laughs> but like, yeah, um, depending on who you talk to. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let's. All right. Let's just play. just a little a little update oh, from Wikipedia. Yeah, it Great. says um, Jeanette and Isabella in the song title are two female farmhands who found the baby Jesus and his mother in a stable. Excited by this discovery, they run to the nearby village to tell the inhabitants, who rush to see the new arrivals. I'm sure there's a little bit more to it, but yeah. <laughs> I guess I think it confirms your theory, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's some little drummer boy. <laughs> yeah. <level> stuff. <laughs> Great. Yeah. All right. Should we play it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Which, uh, ha- what tuning are you in for Bring a Torch, Jeanette, Isabella, and Christmas Eve, Rob? I'm like, in, how do you play in B? I played B, let me think. Um, I guess I just would have been B, F, B, B, F sharp, B. B, F sharp, B, okay. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Are you capoed up or you just tune no, all the way? No, just tune yeah. way down. Okay, yeah. yeah. Great. That's yeah, why he needs the higher lovely. gauge string. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's pretty low. Yeah. I think that was BFB. Yeah. Well, before we go, we'll do one more tune. Mm-hmm. And then before that, where do people go to keep up to date with musical stuff that will happen in the future? Where do people buy your albums? You have three Hog Eyed Man albums now, right? No, actually, we have so we have we have four Hog Eyed Man albums and a fifth in the can. Amazing, so great. We have um, the the first three that we did, you know, by ourselves. Like um, a lot. Actually, the first four that we did by ourselves. Um, the fourth one having some help from Rob's old bandmate, um, and we did those in a studio in town, and some of them like right here in this room. Um, yeah. And then the fourth one came out on Old Time Tiki Parlor's label. So of course, David, yeah. David Bragger, you know, distributes that for us. Um, and then we just went out in June, kind of like in that eye of the COVID storm where we were oh, all vaccinated. Oh, it was such a great month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. June and the first half of July, we're just like, wow, so great. <laughs> I know. It was amazing. It, it, all these stars aligned. Like, we, we, had, our, we had our vaccines. Uh, I was going to be out in California for, for family reasons, Rob's kids were away at camp, mm-hmm. sleepaway camp for a couple of weeks. So, so Rob flew out to LA to, um, our, our, our friends, um, Maxine and Brendan came down from the Bay area. Um, and we all slept at David Bragger's house along with his family and his kids and Susan Platts came over every night and it was like olden times ah, that um, sounds great. with, uh, playing music at night and recording during the day. So we, we recorded a whole new album out there. It was super fun and excited about that. Yeah. And, you know, won't come out till sometime in, in the next year. But um, so so the fourth CD, if, if people still, I know I know Cameron doesn't know what a CD is, but <laughs> for it's true for, for other folks, um, this is this is the fourth one um, it has it actually has Snowbird on it. We played tonight. Uh, and so that can, you can get from David Bragger at Old Time Tiki Parlor. Um, I like that. But, you you seem to have kept the like the art direction like kind of like theme mm-hmm. in that even though it's a yeah. tiki parlor one right yeah like so it's yeah got the same iconography and like color kind of yeah, yeah. So, and that um, long story short people that know about it would would look would know about it already or would look it up or who knows it's um, but there's a, the book series Foxfire you know that series oh I sure think. yeah okay yeah so it's based on fox fire's design the font yeah yeah and the design. great and yeah. the design so the original co- covers and colors were chosen that way and and the woman that um helped us with the first three she's an incredible artist in town lou craigle um and she's done a lot of work with all the athens mm. bands from around here for many decades and she um she did she was passionate about getting it right for our first three records and just like really just like micro making sure the fonts were exactly the same size relative to the shape so they all work together as like a series of books and um and howard rains who we love playing with and just like as a person too him and uh trisha you know play together and uh howard is an incredible artist obviously and he um he was excited about what we were doing and didn't want to mess with our aesthetic yeah. But David David was like, you guys should work together and you'll come up with something cool. And so, well, yeah, you have to look at it to, to see. But um, but Howard did a great job of making it unique and also being faithful to the original idea. But it has a whole yeah. booklet, you know. It's a book, the, yeah, big book. Illustrations and stuff. Mm-hmm. But they're also, those are all on Bandcamp too. So so you can get them digitally on Bandcamp. Yeah. Um, and then we have a website, hogeyedman.com, which um, is in this updated as frequently as it used to be yeah but yeah now that we're you know doing some stuff again maybe we'll we'll get back to that but it has our tune journeys page uh, on it such which a has... great resource it's so great cool <laughs> i love that you do that yeah we'll do some more we should do some more of those yeah yeah I'm, I'm i'm about ready for that yeah but it's basically you know like the 
It's like the liner notes that you would put around a, um, a tune, but a little bit extended and also has like alternative takes and sort of the source recordings that we were influenced by and things like that on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate your approach to... your. You, you have a really great balance as a band of like um, creating something new and exciting and uh, also being nerds. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 having it be edutaining but yeah. not in a like you know uh sugar with your medicine kind of way uh, mm-hmm. but in a, like it both equally valid and happening concurrently and i i really appreciate that so and, uh, can we use a quote it would be hog eyed man edutaining heterophony yeah. and yeah, go ahead it. and put that on the, on the fifth album <laughs> we'll put that on our next record with your name next to it uh Nothing and I'll just say, I'll just, if you don't mind, Cameron, I'll just say, because I just remembered, um, we did a live show a couple months ago. Um, oh, yeah. That, that was a really amazing live show. We hadn't, partly because we hadn't really done one in a long time, at, a, at an underground um, speakeasy. Mm. And we, it was recorded, not with like super great gear or anything, but um, it, it actually came out really nice. And so we're going to... It's about you know a forty five minute show that we're going to put up on the, our Bandcamp page re- probably Great. really soon. We're, we're, we're basically yeah. got it got it ready to go. We'll, we'll send it to you ahead of time, Cameron. Yeah. Please, yeah. <laughs> and that that gives you a chance to kind of hear like someone who hasn't seen us play before. You know, sort of what 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 the whole show sort of feels like when we do a live show. Hmm. I I still haven't seen you two play before, so yeah, yeah. that would be that would be great. I except for here, <laughs> right. Yeah, and your videos that you post. Yeah, we'd love to come out to Portland. Or yeah, just, that'd be yeah. Fun. I wish you would. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah but yeah, we both. both of us I guess you played up there too. I think maybe. I've never played in Portland. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've been to the West Coast to, uh, to play music with other groups, but um, only been to California together to play with Hot Good Man. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, Jason and Rob, thanks so much for doing this and putting in that extra work that I, you know, used to have to ask my podcast guests to do during the pandemic of, <laughs> cause you, yeah. you know, at a festival, you just like sit down and like mm-hmm. we chat a little bit and then we right. start playing, but you had to do all your own sound checking and <laughs> all of that stuff. So I appreciate the effort and, yeah, thank you. uh, yeah, I'm excited to, I'm excited to jam with you. It was, it was fun to do. <laughs> yeah. So should we do the Darley Folks tune um, next, and then you can put Deck the Halls as your bonus? Oh, which one of these is the Darley Folks one? Uh, the, the Snowstorm. The Snow... Okay, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So this That's is in C. So this is a C tune yeah. that maybe he's playing in D shapes? The, well, so... Maybe? <laughs> maybe. Um, I yeah. don't think so. Yeah. Okay. So, so my, you know, but I've been wrong before about stuff like this, for sure. Um, to my ears, he is playing this out of C shapes. Okay, uh, so like actually tuned up. Actually, just in standard tuning. Yeah. Playing or yeah, C- tuned. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm I th- I'm pretty I sure so. that that Bruce Green disagreed with me, which means huh. that I'm probably wrong. But you know, when I played it for him out of the C shapes, I, I felt like he was like, "Oh, okay, maybe." Yeah. So you know, it's. <laughs> Um, and, and in general, I, you know, like I said before, like, I think there's less consensus where, where Darley Folks is playing this because he, he certainly was able to play out of, um, more challenging keys and standard tuning. Sure. And so the finger shapes were no problem for him, but this it's, is a fun tune. Go back, you know, you should go and listen to the original of this. Yeah. Um, because you know, there's no accompaniment with it and Rob, um, this is one where like the guitar was, I feel like is really essential. I mean, I like the original huh. with its, it's kind of more free form. And if you listen to any Dolly Folk stores recording, it's got that like, he ta- it's he like quarter it notes. Yeah. yeah. It's so cool. It's I tried really cool. to do that when I play his tunes and I can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's hard. I know your, 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 your Achilles tendons is wear out too, too soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, he's got all those weird long notes that he puts into tunes and just the style that, that. I, I I can't figure out where it came from. It's not like any of his musical neighbors, um, but this is a, a fun tune. And when Rob figured out how to play a guitar on it, it just became regularized in a um, in a really neat way, and sort of just sounds like a blues tune, and you know to cool. some degree. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Thanks again, and Merry Christmas. You, you too, too, Cameron. Merry Have Christmas. Good, good see, to see you. That sounds good. You, it, you, <laughs> uh, you, you wore that phrase out. That worked perfect. <laughs> you wore it out or yeah, you wore just, it well? You wore it well. Yeah. <laughs> Both. You may, if you wore it out, I guess you're not going to do Christmas anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Buy Hog Eyed Man's albums at hogeyedman.bandcamp.com and visit their website hogeyedman.com to check out their tune journeys and watch their videos. You can find links for that and everything I'm about to mention in the show notes on your podcast app. You can support Get Up in the Pool by sharing the show with a friend or sharing and liking the video posts on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And help fund this podcast by signing up at patreon.com slash getupinthepool. You can order a mask, t-shirt, sticker, bag, or phone case at Up in the Pool's merch store. Pretty good Christmas presents, I think. Visit pitchforkbanjo.com for my instructional claw hammer banjo series or to schedule a lesson with me. Check out my other podcast, Think Outside the Box set. It's available in all the same places as Get Up in the Pool. We just did a Christmas episode for that one where I got wine drunk and my co-host and I reviewed Justin Bieber's album Under the Mistletoe, which is one of the strangest holiday albums I've ever heard. Go check that out wherever you get podcasts. And again, everything I just mentioned is linked in the show notes for this episode in your podcast app. That's all for now, friends. Thanks for listening. Come back same time next week to get up in the cool and Merry Christmas. <laughs>